For those of you watching in VR at home, I'm going to be doing my best to give you stage directions because as Mo mentioned, there are going to be slides kind of flying from different directions. So those of you here in the room, you're going to hear me do, doing that. Hopefully that's, that's not too awkward. I'm talking to two different audiences at once, uh, which is a first for me. Um, so thank you guys for having me be part of your first kind of test case. This is, this is very exciting. Um, so um, my name is Mike Bullen, as Loretta mentioned. I'm editor of Artillery. And over the next 20 minutes, I hope to go over some of the biggest kind of trends and opportunities that I'm seeing as an analyst um, looking at VR and AR. Quick bit about me. I'm a 12-year uh, industry analyst, former tech journalist. Uh, my focus areas are emerging tech. But over the last year, I've really started to focus in and refine my coverage on VR and AR. Um, that includes San Francisco chapter president of VR AR Association and contributions to places like Upload. And I just soft launched the company that I encourage you guys to all check out, which is called Artillery. And it's the world's first publication and market research firm that focuses just in on augmented reality. And you can check that out at artillery.co. And the full release will be coming soon. But I welcome you to check it out until then. Um, so VR and AR, of course, they're very interrelated. Um, they are uh, both very exciting. They are different, but also interrelated. Uh, we believe they're going to converge eventually. Um, but I'm actually more excited about AR, augmented reality. And I think that VR has a lot of potential. I have a, you know, a lot of fun looking at it. And I think that, you know, as we'll go over in this presentation, it's still ripe for a lot of uh, conversation and opportunity. But some of the reasons I'm more excited about AR include the fact that it's eventually going to be bigger. It's going to take longer, but it's going to be bigger. These are numbers from DigiCapital. Um, these numbers have been kind of contentious in terms of their overall absolute values. But I only bring them up here in terms of the delta between virtual reality and augmented reality in terms of eventual market opportunity and revenues. And some of the reasons for this kind of 3x delta um, are that AR, I think, will have a lot more commercial applicability to a wider range of verticals. Um, it's going to be big in commerce and retail, um, in manufacturing and design, in enterprise. And another metric I usually like to look at as an analyst, which I call media time, sorry, share of media time per day. So you know, there is a certain amount of time per day that we all spend with media. Um, you know, it's subdivided between different competing formats like television, radio, print media, online, mobile, all of these things. Now, VR, I think, is because of its full immersion, is really only eligible to take over a certain kind of amount of minutes or hours per day. Whereas AR, we're not there yet for lots of reasons, technically and culturally, but eventually it is conceivable that it can be worn um, throughout all kind of waking hours. Now, focusing just in on VR first, um, I always like to say we're in an iPhone 1 like moment with VR. Um, now, the iPhone 1, the first year that it was out in 2007, can anyone remember how many apps were available in the App Store? Uh, or just if you want to guess. And the people watching in VR can also guess, but I, I guess I won't hear the answer. Um, uh, but does anyone want to guess, you know, that first year, bef you know, before 2008, how many, how many apps were in the App Store? Yeah, yeah that's like, exactly right. The App Store didn't actually come out. That was a trick question, and you guys, you guys got it. The App Store didn't come out until 2008. So we often forget that the first year was just those like 17 apps that shipped with the device, which kind of really limited the commercial appeal and the initial market penetration. Um, now, I mentioned that for two reasons. The first reason is that after the App Store came out, it opened up a developer environment, which led to years of third-party innovation and creativity all the way up until today, um, including you know, lots of different use cases that were built on that initial hardware foundation and things that we never even thought of when the device first came out. Um, everything from Uber, Uber to Pokemon Go, excuse me. Um, the other reason I mention this is that until we get to that point, we're now kind of stuck in these early days, just like the iPhone in that first year, where it's a classic chicken and egg challenge that we see with emerging technology, where there aren't enough apps or content to really sway mass adoption just yet. Um, and conversely, there aren't enough hardware devices being sold in the marketplace to conversely compel content creators to get past the business case or justify the business case of investing in long form content to really kind of fill those content libraries. So there are a few things that I'm observing that is kind of chipping away at this content chicken and, and, and egg uh, situation. Um, and, and for those of you watching, this next slide is, is going to be behind you. So if you can't see it, turn around. Um, 
So um, one of the things we're seeing is a diversification of the content libraries. So at early days, what we see is that 72% um, of consumer software revenue, this is data from Superdata, um, is, is at, for games uh, or attributed to games. Now, by 2020, that overall pie is going to grow massively to roughly $14 billion in revenue. However, the share going to games is going to shrink and open the door for other forms of content, media and, excuse me, media and entertainment, and then also social media. And I think that's important because it's going to start to broaden the content libraries to appeal to a wider swath of the mainstream public to really get uh, VR to kind of where we need it to be in terms of that mass adoption. Now, uh, this next slide, um, for those of you watching in VR, is immediately to, to my left, so it's, it's over here. Um, so um, back to the kind of hardware end of that chicken and egg challenge, these are a few headlines just from the past few weeks. These are things that are announced around GDC and Mobile World Congress. Google shipped 10 million cardboard VR viewers. Sony reached the milestone of 100 million PSVR headsets sold. Um, and these are some important kind of hardware milestones that are, again, kind of chipping away at that. Um, that chicken and egg challenge of, of content and hardware. Um, now, uh, panning back, and, and this slide actually, for those of you watching in VR, uh, if you can't see it, look down. This is actually down into the right. Um, um, so according to my calculations, total units sold so far for um, headsets is just under 17 million units. Um, and you know that's really starting to segment into different kind of tiers uh, that, that map to different kind of quality and price points. Um, but the, the tier that everyone's mostly paying attention to is that top tier, PlayStation VR, HTC Vive, and the Oculus Rift. And within that tier, the clear winner in terms of units sold um, is the PSVR. And I think that holds an important lesson. It's not only at a, a smaller price point, but right out of the gate, it is automatically already compatible with 50 million existing units out there of PS4s. Uh, so that further lowers the adoption barrier. Um, Oculus Rift, they just announced that what was previously a $600 headset with $200 for the touch controllers are now bundled together at a $599 price point. I think that's likewise creating a little bit of um, you know, buying empowerment and lowering those pricing upfront um, barriers to, to adoption. HTC hasn't lowered its prices, but it has announced a new um, pricing plan where you can get an HTC Vive for essentially $66 a month for a 12-month plan. Um, we're also seeing elsewhere in the marketplace things like Windows Holographic, which is actually now called Windows uh, Mixed Reality. Um, and they're working with OEMs to kind of make uh, headsets that are at about a $400 price point. Um, at um, GDC, we also saw LG come out with a headset. So the point is there's a lot more kind of price competition out there um, that's really uh, making these barriers to adoption lower a bit. Um, so those of you watching, uh, in VR, the next, this next slide is coming in uh, to the left of me from the top. Um, so some of the things that I believe represent the nearer term scalable opportunities for VR, given all those kind of pricing challenges, uh, there are a few of them. One is location-based VR, uh, and that includes VR theme parks and VR um, uh, movie theaters, IMAX is doing a lot there, um, and VR arcades. Um, and what this essentially does, it is allows people to have these temporal or experiential VR um, experiences where they're essentially, instead of buying the hardware, they're renting it for a short time. And I think that, that lowers that adoption barrier. So we're going to see that, I think, in the near term as a business opportunity. And interestingly, there's a historical parallel there within the late 70s and 80s, before home game console ownership was ubiquitous, we saw this kind of same thing happening. So it's interesting seeing history repeat itself. Before that really becomes something that's ubiquitous for home ownership, it's going to follow that same evolutionary path. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity. Another leading indicator there is all of the kind of location-based VR we see happening throughout Asia that I believe is going to start to replicate um, here in the US. So the other factor besides location-based VR that I think is going to really make the near-term opportunity for VR scale is mobile VR. So back to some of those hardware numbers, if you look at that top tier of, um, of uh, VR hardware, so the Oculus Rift, HTC Vive, and the PSVR, According to IDC, their total sales um, are around 6 million. Um, and they're going to grow to about 64 billion, I'm sorry, 64 million units by 2020. And that's you know, 10x growth in about four years, very healthy growth. And we're very bullish on that and supportive of that. But interestingly, it pales in comparison to the current kind of hardware that's ubiquitous in the marketplace, which is smartphones, which are 2.6 billion uh, globally. 
So um, that really kind of screams out that the nearer term opportunity, though everyone's excited about that tier one VR, the near term opportunity is really going to be with mobile VR. And of course, that includes things like cardboard. But um, what I'm referring to is that kind of developing mid-tier of the market that includes HTC Vive and Google Daydream. Um, and Google Daydream is actually a platform I'm very bullish on for a lot of reasons. I think it's for a lot of consumers, especially in the mainstream, a, a, a good enough platform, but also one that is really going to start to scale. I think Google's going to put a lot of muscle behind this. Google is known for making big moves wherever it can really position itself at the front door of a new media. And that's exactly what it did with Android about 10 years ago. So I think what we see happening with Daydream is, is going to be analogous and another kind of historical parallel. I know that's kind of a threaded theme here, I'm starting to realize, um, with uh, what it's done with, with Android. So I think the way that's going to play out is that we're going to see more and more devices that carry Android Nougat and also the hardware specs to be compatible with Daydream. And then from there, there's going to be essentially a larger addressable market of compatible devices when developers are making the decision about where to develop. Um, they're naturally incentivized to have a larger reach. Um, so then from there, you're going to have more content from that factor. And then in turn, there's going to be more content and more user appeal. So it's kind of a virtuous cycle that we're going to see happen with Daydream that's going to position it um, a as a platform that I think is going to be very strong. I I'm recommending to a lot of clients and others that I talk to, especially media companies that are curious about where they place their chips, where they start to develop, it's going to be a good kind of first step platform for a lot of companies getting into VR. Um, and this slide um, actually should be, uh, for those of you watching on VR, should be right next to the previous one. So it should be evident of where you can see it. Um, so uh, still kind of staying for a second on, on mobile VR, I think it's interesting because it's going to represent both the short-term and the long-term opportunity for VR. The short-term for all the reasons I mentioned, cost, accessibility. Then we're going to move into a phase, what I call phase two, which is going to be around 2018 to 2020, when PC and console VR will become more ubiquitous. We'll see Moore's Law kick in. We'll see capabilities increase and price come down for all those higher end features, things like positional tracking and frame rates and, and other things that are developing in parallel, like haptic feedback. Um, and then right around 2020, I believe we're going to go into a phase, um, which is essentially phase three, that's phase three, excuse me, that's the best of both worlds. That is, you know, all that high-end functionality we associate with tethered VR, but in an untethered package. And I think as that happens, it's going to be interesting because when um, the use case is freed up a little bit, um, we're going to see more kind of development around that more, I guess, portable type of use case in terms of the apps that are developed. Um, I think it's important to note, too, that the same goes for AR in terms of that mobile story, how it's going to be mobile and hard, um, excuse me, um, smartphones are going to represent the, um, the nearer term opportunity. Um, and, and for those of you watching on VR, this slide is, is kind of close to me. You can see it up, up to the left. Um, so mobile VR, um, you know, for all those same reasons of just kind of hardware penetration, and I think not just for the kind of technological reasons that, and cost reasons that are driving that concept in VR, as I just went over, but the additional factor of kind of cultural acclimation and cultural acceptance. As I mentioned early because, earlier, because VR is something we're wearing all day, potentially, eventually, out in public, that uh, kind of cultural acceptance factor is really going to be key. So I think for a lot of those reasons, and I think we learned that from watching Google Glass, one of the reasons that it kind of tanked in early days was before its time, but also just culture wasn't ready for that use case. And in addition to um, smartphones, uh, there's another kind of wild card in this scenario that I've been looking at, which is other forms of AR that aren't necessarily graphical. We always think of AR as a graphical overlay to the world around us. And I've been thinking in terms of kind of audible. Um, and, and what I mean by that one example is if you look at some of the um, kind of smart earbuds that are coming into the market, uh, the most popular one is probably um, Apple's AirPods. Um, that engenders a use case because they're so small and sleek to essentially leave them in your ear all day, which then opens the door, I believe, for a kind of ambient audio channel that kind of whispers in your ear to inform you about your surroundings. So I think it carries a lot of the tenets and the values of what we're looking for in, in kind of the, the when AR's day kind of gets here. But, but I think that'll happen sooner and be more of a kind of audible 
um, kind of layer on top of our perceived world as opposed to graphical. So I think there's going to be a lot of other kind of creative ways this developed around that. So in the meantime, um, we're seeing kind of this, this proposition of mobile AR um, already start to develop. There we go. Um, I was actually talking to Matt about this earlier. Um, you know, some of the early examples that are really kind of testing out the marketplace and revealing some of the user acclimation and user appeal around mobile AR are things like um, Snapchat 3D stickers and, of course, Pokemon Go. Now, whenever you say these, there are a lot of people that kind of jump down your throat that this is like not true AR. Um, and, and in some ways, they're right. I think true AR or eventually evolved AR is getting to the point of graphical overlays that have interactions with the physical world in more dimensionally accurate ways. So things that can kind of hide behind trees or take advantage of the entire kind of light field and utilizing technologies like point clouds. And, um, but the point is, and I was talking about this with Matt, whether or not this is true AR doesn't matter. What matters is that these technologies have done AR a favor by acclimating the mainstream audiences to basically uh, get used to and start to gain kind of affinity for these AR-like experiences. So that when true AR really does arrive, um, the adoption cycle will be faster because everyone would have already gotten kind of hooked on the gateway drug that, that is Pokemon Go. Um, so um, winding down, um, there are you know, several things here that uh, I'll reiterate from, from like the last 20 minutes of presenting. Um, some of the winning factors in VR and AR and also some of the just kind of orbiting factors that, that are going to affect the mainstream uh, scalability. Um, one is cost. Um, I, I didn't mention it earlier, but a company called EDAR has done a study, uh, basically consumer research and surveys, where they found out that it's only about 10% of the population is willing to pay um, 500 or more uh, for a VR headset. So it's no coincidence that you're starting to see 400 as a price point that's being kind of a target for a lot of companies that are announcing upcoming products. I mentioned Windows Holographic and Windows uh, Mixed Reality. They're working with a number of OEMs to kind of hit a $400 price point. And I think that's going to be a key thing to watch um, to get to that kind of scalability to the next kind of level of inflection point for um, market adoption is when we can kind of get below that $400 uh, price point in a realistic way. Mobile, for the reasons I mentioned, um, the installed base of mobile hardware there make it so much more of a scalable and tenable solution, even though it's not as sexy as the higher end VR hardware. Excel accessibility, excuse me, is an important point too, where we see a lot of um, kind of location-based VR experiences out of the home. Um, people aren't going to be buying these things yet, so allowing them to experience it in more temporal ways, I think, is going to represent a good kind of near-term business opportunity. Um, style and comfort is an interesting point too. Matt, we also talked about this, and one of the, the challenges um, that you know, faces VR and AR, especially probably AR, that didn't face a lot of the previous kind of technological transformations, such as the PC or the commercial internet or mobile, um, is, this, is this sense of style, because it's something that we're going to be eventually, the proposition is to be wearing them. Um, and, and you could argue that with smartphones, you know, design is a factor for choosing the devices we're carrying around, but not as much as something you're putting on your face. And again, it's not just the kind of hardware itself, but the education to the marketplace and the overall market acclimation, where not just the person wearing it, worrying about you know, what it looks like or how sleek it is, but also everyone around them. There are privacy concerns there. There's a lot there that I think still need to be hammered out. And then lastly, native functionality. For developers of, of both VR and AR, but kind of probably more so VR in the nearer term, um, to really pay attention to uh, building things that make sense natively with the functionality and the capabilities of mobile, I'm sorry, VR platforms. And another historical parallel I'll give there is that the most successful apps and um, sources of content we saw with the mobile revolution or the smartphone revolution, which started about 10 years ago, were the things that really you know, took advantage of the natural capabilities of this new platform. Um, rather than shoehorning a desktop experience or desktop content or apps onto a smaller screen. So we're talking about things like the accelerometer and the GPS and the camera and the apps that really take advantage and you know, push the kind of development to the extent of the platform that's available. Um, and and you know, examples of that are things like Waze and, again, Pokemon Go and Uber and a lot of these success stories, I think, really hold that kind of common 
uh, winning factor. So the, the translation is with VR, the apps I think that we're going to see be the most successful uh, from a development perspective, from an investment perspective, are those that really kind of carry that principle um, and develop for the full capabilities of the platforms. And, and that full capabilities is certainly a moving target when you look at things such as room scale and eye tracking and haptic feedback and all these things that are going to come into the picture. But those that really, I think, keep up with that, um, rather than just kind of take 2D media and put it in an immersive environment, um, Mo actually kind of alluded to that concept earlier, um, I think that's going to be very important. Um, and, and again, a lesson we've learned in the previous tech um, kind of revolution that I think uh, has some good historical parallels and good learnings for going forward. Um, so that is actually, um, that's it for me. I have time for questions, and I look forward to also integrating and uh, talking to you guys after. For those of you watching in VR, this slide is actually uh, left of me on the floor. So look down, and you can see contact information.